What's up, everybody? I'm Katie. And I'm Morgan. And this is For Your Misinformation. We are two Midwestern feminists here to break down the political news that you need to know without the misinformation that you don't. Let us break down the problem and tell you what we're doing and what you can do to help solve it. Hi, everyone. I'm going to try something a little bit different this week. Um, I had kind of a rough week. I, if any of you did this, I would be sad slash upset with you, but I decided to try and go off of my antidepressants on my own and it didn't go well. So for like four days in a row, I slept like 14 hours and then Clark was finally like, hey, maybe don't do that. And I was like, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So I did not do a deep dive into anything this week, Uh, but instead, what I think I'd like to try, I'd like to do like a democracy vibe check and explain, instead of like a deep dive into one topic, kind of just lightly touch on all the different things that are going on right now, like my interpretation of them and like how they fit into the bigger picture. I don't know. It's sort of irrelevant, like, how I feel on April 12th about what's going on, but I guess it all, like, adds up. So, again, I keep getting anxious and then reminding myself that I need to think in, like, larger time frames, like, more like decades. So, uh, I don't know, five out of ten right now, but it doesn't even matter because it could totally go either way depending on so many different things. So let's try and give like some historical context to current events. We've talked about the end of the Civil War and how key Ulysses S. Grant was. We're at a critical inflection point. I know I keep saying that we're at a critical inflection point. And the last time we were at an inflection point like this, and I, you know, say this because there was a coup on January 6th. Ulysses S. Grant came out super strongly against white supremacy and passed amendments and would not let the South, you know, he sent the military to occupy the South when they would not um, uh, comply with the laws. And so we need Joe Biden to be like as strong on white supremacy as Ulysses S. Grant was. Uh, But not just that. (laughs) We also need him to be like as pro social safety net as Lyndon B. Johnson and FDR. And we need him to do all of that probably before 2022, because right now, well, because historically uh, the party in power loses seat at the midterm elections, the midterm elections are in 2022. Uh, We have a very, very, very slim majority. I mean, we don't even have a majority in the Senate. There's a 50-50 split. And uh, so I guess this is why I feel less optimistic. Joe Manchin just said he won't abolish the filibuster. So the Senate parliamentarian. Also, I'm going to try this is I'm going to try to cover a lot of topics and not go super deep into any of them because I don't want this to be a very long episode. Joe Manchin says, won't abolish the filibuster. Senate parliamentarian has ruled that they can do budget reconciliation again, which is really uh, cool. But for stuff like civil rights and democracy reform, like HR1, which would, um, well, no, too many details. You know, you know what HR1 is about. You can Google it. Um, or HR4 or DC statehood. All of that. Um cannot be passed through budget reconciliation, which only requires 51 votes or 50, yeah, 51 votes instead of the 60 that you would need uh, to pass stuff that doesn't apply to the filibuster. Damn, this is going by so fast. Um, But the Senate makes their own rules. Like, they can get rid of the filibuster if they wanted to. Joe Manchin clearly doesn't understand the importance of what's going on right now. Neither does Kirsten Cinema. If you're listening to this, you would be a better senator than Joe Manchin. I swear to God, I believe that a hundred percent. I don't. I don't know who you are. I believe that you have the the what it takes to be a better senator than Joe Manchin. The Senate makes their own rules, so if it's broken, you can fix it. If an entire political party has decided that democracy is not important, you don't have to engage with them in good faith anymore. I just keep thinking about like if after the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant had been like, well, I would love to pass this, these amendments that say that black people matter, 
But there's this silly little rule in the Senate that they made up themselves that I just, I don't know what you want you guys want me to do. It's like, oh, it's just so ridiculous to think that a silly rule like the filibuster that they made up themselves should get in the way of, especially right now, H.R. 1, which would protect voting rights when there have been hundreds of bills introduced that are trying to take away people's right to vote. This, sorry. So this is going to be kind of like a, uh, what is that called? Something, con- string, no, something of consciousness, string of consciousness. Well, I don't know. But like, so what that reminds me of is I follow Dan Crenshaw on um, Instagram. You probably know who he is. He's the Republican guy from Texas. He's a house rep. He has the eye patch. He went on. So he's one of my least favorite (laughs) representatives. He was like in the military. It just seems like he doesn't understand that his job is legislating and not like, (laughs) I don't know, starting shit. Like all he ever does is complain about Biden at least on Instagram. But like his job is to legislate, to make laws so that to make better laws. So is Matt Gates, but we'll get to him. So yeah, he went on Joe Rogan to like debunk, you can't see me, but like air quotes, debunk um that voter ID is racist and it's like guys, just cuz you don't understand why it's racist doesn't mean it's not racist. Like the intent of the laws might not be racism, although I think it is since there's no proven voter fraud. Uh, but the impact is that less poor people, less black people, less people of color are going to be able to vote. So yes, whether you understand it or not, whether it was your intention or not, the voter ID laws are racist. So just because you don't understand why they are that way, Dan Crenshaw, Joe Rogan, whoever you are, doesn't mean that they're not. Speaking of people who uh, taxpayers pay their salary, Matt Gates, um, shit's crazy and it's getting crazier. I hope, can we just agree to call this Gates Gates? Gates Gate? So he is just like a huge piece of shit. And I guess if you take anything away from this podcast, I hope it's that like you deserve better from your partners and you deserve better from your politicians. And Matt Gates is like the perfect example of all of that. Fun fact, he grew up in the Truman House, the Truman Show House. Um, He's like your typical, his dad was in Republican politics. Like that's how he became successful in Republican politics at a pretty young age in Florida. But yeah, he has, I don't know. I learned today that his district is in the panhandle, which I guess people refer to more as like not even Florida. Uh, What did I want to say about Matt Gates? Just like, like he has, like Joel Greenberg is his friend from Republican politics. There's another uh, Republican politician, or he, I think he lost his rate. It, you know what? Too many details. Doesn't matter. Another Republican politician in Florida just got in trouble for this. So the other crazy thing is that like Matt Gates is getting in trouble uh, for what QAnon pretends Democrats are doing. And it's, are they like pretty silent on it? Matt Gates, like, his main argument is that, like, well, one, I paid the women, and it's fine. (laughs) Like, all my friends think it's fine to have sex with 17-year-olds as long as you pay them, so, like, I don't understand what the problem is. Like, it seems like he genuinely doesn't really even understand that he did something wrong, but he's, he's just, like, spiraling now. Like, he's, that man is going to jail, almost certainly, and I don't know. I'm, I'm sure we'll keep talking about it, but, like, If you scratch the surface, like, this is what most of the Republican Party is going to end up looking like in my, like, what I think, like, Matt Gates is the Republican Party. So, yeah, he paid, (laughs) he paid people on Venmo, underage women on Venmo for sex, uh, which, you know, that's, I don't even know if we would call if it's appropriate to call that like underage prostitution or if that's just like abusing young girls well <sighs> but uh he was accused of that he did he did a lot of it on venmo which like not not super sneaky not the brightest bulb and then so he that uh started being investigated under bill Barr's department of justice during the Trump administration, so like not any kind of witch hunt, 
Um, it seems like what happened is some people, like troll kind of people, found out about this Department of Justice investigation and they came to Matt Gates's dad and they were like, hey, we heard your son is in some trouble. I think they wrote him a letter. Um, we have an idea. We'll like make him a hero. If you give us more money, we'll go find Robert Levinson, who's been like a prisoner of war uh, for a decade and a half, like absolutely presumed dead. I feel bad that they even like dragged this guy's family into it and said like, hey, uh, we have proof of life of Robert Levinson. We will go. We will give your son, Matt, credit for this. It will make him a hero. Biden will pardon him from these child sex trafficking charges because you can't it's against the law to bring someone over state lines and pay them for sex something like that especially if they're 17 and he so matt gates is trying to focus heavily on this extortion bit um which you know extortion's probably not great but like i couldn't extort you for that because you haven't done it Like, you're not under investigation by the Department of Justice for this. So if I was like, hey, um, why don't you just give me $25,000 and uh, I'll make this whole thing go away? You'd be like, well, fuck off. I haven't transported any 17-year-olds across state lines. Like, I'm not in trouble for anything. And then I, the whole plan would fall apart. So that's not what's happening here. He's trying to focus on the extortion part. But it's like, Matt, what are you being extorted for? Oh, child trafficking? Well, did you it if you're doing it the child trafficking, like that's what makes you able to be extorted. That's what makes you extortable. So maybe if you didn't do that, you wouldn't so this whole thing's imploding. It is so crazy. I can't I mean It's one of the more interesting things to keep up with. So I'm sure I'll keep you guys updated. He's definitely going to jail. And it's unfolding like quickly. So we'll keep paying attention. What else is going on that makes me feel okay or not okay? D.C. statehood is the bill is going to be on the move in the House this week. So there's a committee markup scheduled for April 14th. And then also D.C. Emancipation Day is on Friday, April 16th. So D.C. actually emancipated um, the enslaved people there, I think, a full eight months before the Emancipation Proclamation was, um, I don't know, declared or whatever. And then side note, Juneteenth is the date, I think, three years later when the final slaves in Texas found out that they were no longer uh, legally able to be enslaved. So pretty fucked up country we got here. But yeah, so there are there are six, I think it is, there are six, yes, six Democratic or Democratic caucusing senators who have not committed to supporting D.C. statehood yet. When it, um, and that's a problem. Kirsten Sinema and Mark Kelly, both senators from Arizona, uh, have not come out in supporting D.C. statehood yet. And again, so like I'm no longer interested in what's popular or what is like what is likely possible to get passed. I'm interested in what like the right thing to do is. And in my mind, like giving people representation in their government is the right thing to do. Like enfranchising voters is the right thing to do. And there are 70,000 people in D.C., mostly people of color, who don't have any voting representation in the Senate. You know, D.C. is bigger than some some states, and it, it just it is a little bit crazy that they don't have the right to vote. And there were some concerns with the founding fathers about why they didn't want D.C. to have statehood. Those guys were not as smart as we pretend like they were. Like, they owned people. They thought women were property. They did not ever intend for me to vote. They did not ever intend for black people to vote. We can revise some of their ideas. Not all of their ideas were gold star ideas. And it turns out that 700,000 mostly black people 
in uh, in D.C. not being able to have representation in the Senate, it turns out to be pretty unfair, just like a lot of other st- other ideas that they had. Uh, a lot of their views on fairness were pretty fucked up. So I'm going <laughs> to tell you the other other people in the Senate who have not committed to supporting D.C. statehood yet. It is so Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly in Arizona, G- Jeannie Jean. How do you pronounce? Wow. Jeannie Shaheen? Jean Shaheen in New Hampshire? I'm really sorry, New Hampshire. Somebody can correct me. I should probably just Google it. Joe Manchin, of course, in West Virginia. John Hickenlooper in Colorado, who usually seems pretty cool, so I don't know what his deal is. Um, and Angus King in Maine. So they are the last Democratic or Dem caucusing members who have not come out in favor of D.C. statehood, and we need them to. And I'm pretty sure you can just text. You can text the name of your state, if you live in one of those states, to 97779. So, like, if you live in Arizona, you can text Arizona to 97779. Um, If you live in Maine, text Maine to 97779. You get it. Um, And they will connect you with a script so that you can call your senator, take action, Basically, the, the, the takeaway is that, like, enough is enough. It's time for D.C. statehood and just calls them out on refusing to support statehood for the D- District of Columbia, which is hist- an historically b- black city, which has been disenfranchised for se- uh, centuries. And the other thing is, like, what do the people of D.C. want? Like, what do they view as fair? They are 700,000 taxpaying Americans who want freedom and independence, but instead live under taxation without representation, which is how, you know, all of our entire country started. So it just doesn't seem like something that we, that is a, it just seems like a value that we should be able to agree on, in my opinion. I just think we need to like shift that Overton window of what people think is okay and not okay to being like, shift towards fairness, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, all right, I'm going to try and, try and speed things up. So I don't know. I'm not super optimistic about it. Also, like we have to do all of this big stuff before 2022 because we will probably lose the House or the Senate or both. But also, Joe Manchin said he won't abolish the filibuster. So it's really unlikely that we'll be able to pass anything except for stuff through budget re- reconciliation, which means like no Equality Act, no PRO Act which is about labor labor organizing. No, it just, we really, really need to shift uh, f- to a more like class solidarity and understanding class struggle, I guess, is really the point. So if Joe Manchin really is not going to move on the filibuster, then it's more important that we keep those majorities and actually increase our majority in the Senate so Joe Manchin's opinion on the filibuster doesn't matter anymore. And truly to me, it just seems like this man loves having this much like attention and power. Like he's not using it wisely. He's not, he's not like listening to the people who are the most vulnerable. He just loves that like everything hinges on him. And I don't think that's a great quality in a legislator. All right, what else? Some bullshit going on with uh, gender affirming care. Um, medical experts in lo- in lots of different places. Um, Arkansas most recently, their governor vetoed the bill, but then they have Republican supermajorities in their legislatures, so the legislatures overrode that veto. So now, trans kids can't get the gender affirming care that they need. Um, it is medically necessary, and it can be life saving for transgender youth. You all you need to do is act at ask transgender youth, um, but politicians are trying to come between those youth and the care that they need. Um, it is classic for Republicans to use kids a, as like a fear tactic and fear monger. Um, but like really, what we should be doing is looking at like, okay, who are these policies going to help? In theory, cisgender high school girls who are having to compete against. <laughs> athletes who have unfair physical advantages that's what they're trying to that's the people that this policy is trying to protect in theory 
Um, in practice, it just harms transgender kids who already have a much harder time in general. Um, so again, intent versus intent versus impact is really important. What is going on? Oh, Amazon. I am sad that the Amazon workers, it seems like they voted like two to one not to unionize. But I do think this is probably a like beginning of class solidarity awakening. Um, you know, workers and communities have been standing up to Amazon's greed and abuses for years. And we, it, you know, Jeff Bezos is the richest person in the world. He made enough money to give every single person who works at Amazon $110,000 and he would still be just as rich as he was at the beginning of the pandemic. And instead of doing that, he is employing just incredible union busting tactics. So again, like if they didn't, if he didn't want them to unionize or if he didn't care if they unionized, he wouldn't work so hard to get them not to. If they didn't care that we voted, they wouldn't work so hard to make it so that it's really almost impossible for some people to vote. So, I don't know, we do eventually need to break up Amazon's grip on our economy, um, but I just would encourage everybody to remember that what's happening in Bessemer is a, a result of Amazon's unchecked corporate power and um, what, what corporations have done for decades to diminish the power of labor law so that they can get the most profit out of us as possible. And that is what it comes down to is like Jeff Bezos is exploiting their labor to the point where like they straight up have to pee in bottles or else they won't meet their quotas. And people working at Amazon, like they just thought that everybody already knew that. Like sometimes they would tell uh, they wouldn't even like mention that to journalists because they just thought it that like it was a thing that everybody understood. But like that's a thing that happens on the reg is to meet their quotas and stuff. They have to like pee in bottles. And that's because Jeff Bezos is trying to exploit as much labor out of them as possible. And because he pays um, $15 an hour, like Amazon, he really like intimidated people into voting against. So anyway, I hope this is just the beginning. I mean, I'm sure it is. I hope that it is like kind of a wake up call and that we're moving in the direction of understanding that like union organizing is really important. I promised to do an episode in the future on the PRO Act. I did go to that uh, pro-life meeting as a spy. As a spy, um, It was infuriating, <laughs> but they did send out a very handy PDF of every single Illinois legislature that I have absolutely saved and will be sharing as a resource, so it was already worth it. Um, but truly, like, their arguments are... One, like, well, the states around us have parental notifications, so shouldn't we have parental notification? And the other one is like, well, <laughs> to me, it's like, yeah, the states around us are scary. Like, Iowa, Missouri, Indiana, like, yeah, we want to be like a bastion <laughs> of, like, ugh. just the arguments are so stupid. Um, And then another one was like, uh, well, the Supreme Court didn't say that it wasn't constitutional, and it's just infuriating. Um, they disabled the chat, <laughs> so at one point I did put something in there that they say, they, oh my gosh, they also say that this law uh, decreases child sex trafficking. No proof of that. No proof of that. Uh, I almost put in like a question and answer box, like, is there one example of that happening in Illinois? And but I, I decided to hold, hold my tongue, held my tongue. So, yeah, they were teaching people to set up meetings with their state legislatures, uh, which is exactly what the other side is doing, too. It was just interesting to see. I hate that they exist. I wish they spent their time actually making the positive difference that they feel like they're doing. But whatever. What else? Oh, Prince Philip died. That guy sucked. I'm not sad about it. Um, if you see news this week about Harry traveling, uh, for the funeral and that Megan is not traveling for the funeral, please keep in mind that that's because she's pregnant and her doctor told her not to travel during a pandemic. Please don't, uh, if you hear anybody else trying to spin that, please tell them that that is the actual case. 
All right, last quote, or last topic that I want to talk about. I talked to for too long. Joe Manchin said that the Capitol insurrection changed him and that that is his cause, the cause of his increased calls for bipartisanship, which is insane. Like, if, if someone tried to murder you, I wouldn't at least be like, hey, do you want to, like, come on my podcast? Do you want to, like, do an episode of my podcast? Like, can we collab? Can we work on something together? Like... It's just the most ridiculous argument, and like I said, if an entire political party has, like, gone off the rails and no longer believes in, like, the virtues of democracy, you don't have to operate in good faith anymore. I mean, you can take the wing of the party, like the Adam Kinzingers or whatever, who have tried to separate themselves from the Matt Gates trump um, side of the party, but, like, so far it doesn't really seem like they're interested in doing that. So that's... I don't know. Those are the the headlines that make me undecided on how I want to feel about democracy. I mean, it totally depends what happens in the future, but that's the way I've been thinking about some of those things. All right. You guys know that I'm a big swimming nerd. I do want to talk some shit about Ryan Lochte for a quick second. I don't really have anything against Ryan Lochte. I think he's like a generally nice dummy. He's like a himbo. And the gas station thing was real sketch. I did not like that, but he did come out and apologize. It seems like he's had kind of a hard life since then. I mean, just in, he's just a dummy, kind of. I don't know. He got suspended from the sport because he was, like, hungover and posted a picture of him with, like, an IV drip on Instagram and then, like, got banned from USA Swimming for, like, 14 months. He just, like, sets his own traps and walks into them. But he came back to swimming. There's a meet this weekend. And he he got scratched into the B final. So he did not make the B final. He did not make top 16. Somebody had to scratch finals for him to be scratched into the B final. He came in last in the B final. His last, so he's swimming at 200 free, his, which is four. It was long course, so it's four laps, down, back, down, back. His last 50 was a 32-something. Which, <laughs> for an Olympic gold medalist, a male, like, I don't know how to put, so he did come in last in the B final. For reference, Katie Ledecky also swam the mile, so not the 200 free, Katie Ledecky swam the mile which is 1,500 yards instead of 200 yards. And every single one of her 50s was faster than Ryan Lochte's. Like, her slowest 50 split was a 31. And she had to do that 30 times instead of Ryan Lochte had... No, I guess she had to do it 15. Hold on. Yeah. So, (laughs) Ryan Lochte's last 50 of his 200 free was slower than any 50 of Katie Ledecky's 1,500, which is also known as the mile. So, I mean, Katie Ledecky is almost superhuman, but still, (laughs) that was was a little embarrassing. And not even the last little bit of trash talk. I feel a little bit bad, but these are just like crazy, crazy stats. Um, Anton Chukov, I think is his name. He's a 200 breaststroker. His last 50 of his 200 breaststroke was like a low 32. It was like faster than Ryan Lochte's last 50 of his 200 freestyle. So, I mean, Ryan Lochte tapers like a champ, but uh, I don't know, man. I don't know if he's going to make this this last Olympics. I, if you remember four years ago, five years ago, um, he only made the team as a relay swimmer in the 800 free relay. So that's a 200 freestyle, and he just swam real slow. I mean, he tapers like a champ. He swims slow in season all the time, but I just thought those were some, like, crazy stats about Ryan Lochte from this weekend. All right, I'm done talking about swimming. I don't think that's what you guys are here for. I think what you guys are probably here for is foster kitten content. The little baby will be two weeks old in a couple days, finally starting to open its eyes. 
It is so fluffy. It has almost more than doubled its weight. It's like 280 grams now. It was like 120 some grams when it was born. And I love it. It's adorable. And I will post some pictures on Instagram. All right. So that is it for our democracy vibe check for this week. Hopefully next week we'll be back with some more of your regularly scheduled programming, some deep dives onto stuff. Um, So I will talk to you guys next week. And in the meantime, hey, piggies, uh, should we make DC a state? Thank you guys so much for listening to For Your Misinformation. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. And if you like it, give us a rating and a review. It helps us find more listeners. And the more of us there are, the better. And make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter at FYMIPod. Shout out to Ben Schlofeld for the audio production, Hope Dye for the podcast art, Kyle Dibdahl for the intro and outro music, and Adam Roston, who edits these videos every week so you can watch them on YouTube. We come out with new episodes every Monday.